had three doses in 2009, and this three dose wasn't possible without the sponsors. We will, you know, we'll, I won't name them, you will find them on the website. And we start off with, uh, I went from the middle who's talking about e-text and how e-text was uh, being open source and all the problems with that one. Give him and back big warm applause. Thank you, Jean-Paul. Uh, so my name is Ivan van den Brande. I'm a Brussels-based IP lawyer uh, specialized in free and open source software. I was one of the uh, founders of the International Free and Open Source Software Law Review. We, lost, uh, we launched uh, this year, so if you feel like, uh, check it out. It's ifoslr.com. Um, actually, I'm falling in for uh, Bruno Loaggi. Uh, Bruno Loaggi is, I don't know whether you know him, the founder of uh, iText. iText is... Uh, uh, yeah, a Java-based uh, PDF uh, library uh, converter, um, and uh, as a lawyer, you it's really difficult to talk about cases because so many things happen. But you always have that confidentiality. I was not involved with iText. Uh, I know Bruno quite well, and I heard him giving this speech. Uh, but that's why I like this case. I'm not involved in it, so I can say whatever I want. You can't hold it against uh, Bruno. So Bruno Loaggi, he made his, his library that allows you to generate PDF files on the fly. He started iText in 1998. Another guy joined him in 2000. And from then on, uh, people just joined. People start uh, sending him uh, code. He thinks, wow, this is great co uh, code. Sometimes he changes that code. Sometimes he implements. Sometimes he does not. Uh, but then suddenly, there's a question, who owns the code after a couple of years? If we are talking about who owns the code, we are talking about intellectual property. We are not talking about who has the code on a disk, but who has, who holds the intellectual property. There is several kinds of intellectual property. I just put a couple of them together. You've got patents, copyright, trademarks. Um, when we are talking about software, we, talk, we mainly talk about uh, copyrights here in Europe. Uh, why patent protection is less in Europe? It's uh, bigger in, in uh, America. Uh, patent software is not patentable as such, but that's a debate I don't want to go into. Let's, for the moment, just talk about copyrights on software. So. Copyright, well, who has, who owns the copyright? Well, it's the author. It's a natural person who actually writes the code. It's uh, the one, the guy who starts writing the code, really types in uh, the, the code. He owns the code. He has the right, the only right to reproduce the work, to modify the work, to convey his work to the public, to distribute it. So if you want to use somebody's code, you have to ask his permission. Not everything is copyright protected, not all code, not everything, not all contributions, but when somebody contributes to your project, to an open source project or whatever project, you should al always start, well, is this code whatever he contributed, is it copyright protected? Is it not copyright protected? You can do with it whatever you want, some exceptions apply, but um, if it is copyright protected, you need his permission. What is certainly not copyright protected, that is the ID, the concept. If somebody says, well, I would solve your problem like this, and he just <laughs> gives you the, the solution without really giving you the written code, you can use his ID. Just like this picture, you cannot copy this picture. It's a nice picture, it's probably original, it's probably copyright protected, but the ID of having a guy holding a bulb above his head, it's not copyright protected. So this picture, for instance, would not infringe on the copyright of the first one. So the ID you can take, the concept you can take, the literally code, control C, control V, you can't take. So it's only the code, only the form that is protected. Not all code is copyright protected. There must be some level of originality. The author must have made some choices, and uh, you must say, hey, yes, 
done a pretty good job here. If uh, it's, it's so obvious, if you uh, if technically only one way to program a code like that, then it's not copyright protected. So there must be a level of originality in the code, otherwise it's not copyright protected. So what is copyright protected? It's uh, the source code, it's the object code, it's a structure, and often it's also the design. In Belgium, under Belgian copyright, we make the distinction because copyright on uh, everything but software, if you're an employee, you still own the copyright on designs, on books you write, on whatever you write, but there is an exception for software. In Belgium, if you write software, uh, the code, that copyright automatically goes to your employer. The other, the design, the template you make, that does not go automatically. In the Netherlands, all copyrights go automatically to your employer. So you write, code, design, whatever, it goes to your employer. But it's, it's, it's different in all European countries, it's different in the States, it's, it's, it's different all over the world. So sometimes the design will be included in whatever you do, sometimes it's not. Now we are, t we are talking uh, the author owns the copyright, but of course who is the author? If you find uh, a code on the internet, who is the author? Who knows? If somebody sends you, like Bruno Lovagy, he, he receives code from, from all kinds of people, how does he know where they got that code? Where, who, who actually owns the rights on the code? Who is the author? It's a good question and, and that's where we are going to talk about. So to resume, Bruno Loewagi, he's a de developer himself. He started making his own code. It was first published online in 1999. Next year, a year later, the other guy joined, there were two, and they completely remade the code together, the both of them. But then, as it was online, people started using it and people started sending code. All kinds of people uh, start from all over the world start contributing. Uh, and then in 2006, there was a question, who owns the IP of ITEX? Well, maybe you ask, who cares? It's free, it's available on the internet. Why would you care who owns the IP on ITEX? Well, IBM cares. In 2006, uh, Bruno got the offer from the Eclipse project to include ITEX uh, in Eclipse, in Eclipse release. It would have been a really big step for ITEX. He really wanted it, but IBM, who took the lead in, in, the, in the Eclipse project, only wanted to go forward with ITEX and with Bruno if he could prove the IP, if the, the IP was cleared. And there was another problem. Uh, IBM didn't like the MPL license, the Mozilla Public License. Uh, so IBM wanted ITEX under a different license, but Bruno had all his contributors contributing under that license, so he couldn't just change the license without their uh, consent. So that was one problem. Second problem was he didn't know who the, the, the owner of the code was. So uh, they agreed to do an entire uh, IP review. Bruno was going to read uh, every line of the code and check where it came from. They made it a rese uh, research project. Bruno works at the University of Kent and uh, Actuat, who is also involved in the Eclipse pr uh, project, contributed and, and so uh, they got him one year working on his ITEX code, an entire year, just to clear the IP. Um, Bruno didn't work with me, I told you, he worked with lawyers from IBM. And so they, they uh, literally went to ever, through every line of the code and they divided it in three zones. The white zone, the grey zone, the black zone. The white zone was pretty obvious, that's what we, they could use. Grey zone, there were some doubts. Black zone, yeah, black is black. So. Let's talk about the white zone first. What did they consider to have the white zone? Or what can you consider to be the white zone? That is the software, the code you've written yourself. Because if you write the code yourself, you're the author, you've got all the rights. But of course, check if you're an employee, check your contract with your employer. If there's nothing in it, 
the code might be owned by your employer if it's part of your everyday job. If you do it at night, of course, it, 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 it will not be implied unless there are some strange clauses in your contract. You might be a contractor, an independent consultant, and you, have, you might have written that code for a client. Then check whether your, your contract, your client, allows you to, to uh, get the code, or to make the code uh, open source. And then, of course, where did you get your inspiration? Getting your inspiration somewhere, getting the ID, is not bad. You can do it. It's not copyright protected. But, of course, you can't go too far. That is why, for instance, IBM, they don't want their developers even to look at code of somebody else, not even to get the ID. Uh, if you want to even look at code, e uh, the IBM lawyers, they have to approve that code. Otherwise, the risk is, is too high for IBM. It's a burden, of course, or, but uh, if you have been through some litigation then, uh, and you made a cost, uh, benefit um, calculation. Well, for IBM, they found out that it is better to have all the code reviewed by their lawyers than just having their developers go rogue and taking uh, code from, from anywhere, even just IDs. The gray zone. What's the gray zone? Well, it's code that got contributed to Bruno. So Bruno started, he, he got code from all over the world, but with that code, there are some questions. Did the contributor agree with the license? It was said that the code would be published under the Mozilla public license, but did the contributor agree? Did he give other con con uh, license conditions? Or Bruno never checked, he just received the code and put it in. Of course, also the question, is the contributor is he allowed to contribute the code? Does he have an, an employer? The, the Apache Foundation, for instance, they really want also your employer to sign a license agreement, not just you, but also your employer if you want to contribute. And uh, where did the contributor get his inspiration? Where did he get, did he copy code from somewhere? So it's, it's a big question that Bruno had to tackle. Um, you can take off, you often can take code from another project. It's uh, published online, it's free software, but different questions. The licenses, are they compatible? For instance, Bruno used the Mozilla public license, but it's not compatible with the GPL3, and the GPL3 is the most popular license. So that means Bruno can't use most of, of the software that's freely online. So do you respect the other project license if you get it in, but if you publish it on other, other lines, does it match? And then, of course, where did the other project get its code from? Maybe you are doing your, your, your work, your homework, but maybe the other project doesn't. And of course, FOSS means no warranty, as is often most of, of, of the closest. Of course, you can get warranty. Bruno, for instance, his company, he offers warranty if you pay for it. So you can get warranty on the code you find online. But uh, there are even insurers these days that are specialized in, in, in uh, offering warranty for uh, free software. But if you just take code from the internet, it's without any warranty. The, the author will not say that it's not a copyright infringement or another infringement. So it's always a risk. How do free software projects solve these risks? It's not really a solution, uh, solving these problems, but how do they tackle them? Well, they have CLAs, SCAs, FLAs, uh, the CLA of the Apache Foundation already said it's not only the, the contributor, but only also the, the employer to, uh, that have to sign it. It's a, a, co a contributor license agreement. And in that license agreement, the contributor says, okay, I own all the rights on this code and I give a license that is almost that broad that they give the property away to uh, the Apache Foundation. Uh, Sun has a similar license, it's a Sun Contributor Agreement. Uh, you have to sign it from the moment you uh, contribute more than 20 lines of code. We said software must be original. If it's not original, it's not copyright protected. Sun uses the rule of thumb of 20 lines. They say if it's less than 20 lines, it's probably 
not original. Of course, some clever people can write something original in 20 lines. Other people even don't manage in 1,000 lines. So it's, uh, it's, it's just a rule of thumb. It's not a, a rule of law. Uh, KDE uses the FLA of the FSIV. The FLA, FLA is the fiduciary license agreement. There, all the contributors actually uh, give, uh, assign their intellectual property to the Free Software Foundation Europe. And the Free Software Foundation Europe is going to give the license to anybody who wants to use it and is going to enforce the license. That is the FLA. Now, of course, we already talked about uh, the license compatibility. Uh, and to do that, you really need to, to keep a detailed inventory of all the licenses you get. If you get code, make sure you've got an inventory of all the licenses uh, you get. And then you can decide what, other, what license you can apply to your software. It's a complicated uh, exercise. Here, for instance, you see a, compati a compatibility flowchart for a GPL uh, version 3. So um, all the licenses that are mentioned above are G uh, compatible with uh, GPL v3, but they are not necessarily compatible with each other. So it's, it's, it's really a difficult uh, question. You have to actually read the licenses and pay attention. The black zone, well, it's uh, pretty obvious. Sometimes if you go to your code, you notice, or at least Bruno noticed, there was code in it he actually couldn't use. He didn't have an authorization, no permission of the author to use. So that code they had to get out or they, they, they had to get permission. They had to ask permission of the author. So that's the two, uh, the two options. Either you get it out either you ask, you contact the author and you ask permission. So the purpose of the IP review, it's, it's, it's pretty obvious. That's what, what, what um, the research project of Bruno was. Uh, get out the gray, get out the black and make sure you end up only with white zone software. Some examples of, of problems he uh, encountered. He, as a Java developer, he often looked at uh, Java world because people just uh, show, they, 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 they load up software there, code, and, and they exchange IDs. So in his opinion, he was allowed to use that software, that code. But if you go and look into the details, then uh, you read that Java world actually retains all copyrights on the contributions on, the, on, on its website. And it gives a really, really limited non-commercial license only for um, academic purposes. Now Bruno wanted to have an other kind of license, also wanted to allow commercial use, so he couldn't use uh, Java World software anymore. It was a big problem for him because he, he uh, relied a lot on it. So what did he have to do? He had to contact uh, Java World, uh, explain them what he intended to do, what the purpose was of uh, iText, he had to get the authors who uploaded the code, ask their permission as well. And once he got the uh, permission of both Java World and all the authors, he could start using the code. When he was doing that exercise, he noticed that there was a lot of code on the internet that just doesn't have any license. Then you have to contact the, uh, the author. If you can't contact him, it's just impossible to use that code if you want to do it correctly. And uh, if, so, if you start using code from the internet, it must be a second nature to you to contact either to verify the license conditions and to be very sure you actually can use that code, or you have to ask the author and get his permission and document it, of course. Another uh, problem he, he encountered was um, uh, the ACME uh, problem there. Um, also on this website, people just contribute. Uh, Bruno took a uh, code from there, but then he, he noticed that in the code he took there, it was written that it's based on JavaSoft and he knew JavaSoft well, it's Sun software and it's impossible that Sun is going to give such a broad license on that software. So he realized that the guy who uploaded that software on uh, the ACME website, that 
yeah, it, it, it was just impossible that that license would be uh, associated to it. So he, he realized he couldn't use it. The, the guy who uploaded it, he based 90, he says himself, 90% of my software, of my code is based on Javasoft. So he doesn't have any rights himself on Javasoft. So he cannot upload it himself and decide to give it for free, for to give it under a free software license on the internet. So um, what did... Yeah, I've got some issues with uh, uh, OpenOffice. Uh, they changed the color of my uh, presentation. Uh, so but his, 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 uh, his solution was uh, go for that particular class to another free software project that he could, that he could trust. In this case, it was uh, a project from the Apache Foundation. And there he found exactly, or more or less, exactly the same routine. And so he could use that. So he decided not to use the uh, the untrustworthy code from uh, the ECMAS uh, website, but uh, the Apache Foundations. Another example. When he was going through his code, he noticed that there was a mention to RC4. Well, RC4, it's, it's old. Uh, it's, it's, it's actually an old trade secret, but uh, it got disclosed in 1994, so it's the same with the Coca-Cola formula. It's not protected, there is no patent on it, it's, it's, it's not protected. It's just that Coca-Cola doesn't tell anybody his secret. So, and as long as nobody knows your secret, it's safe, it's yours. RC4 was a secret, but uh, somebody disclosed it in 1994, and once it's disclosed, yeah, you can't retain it. So everybody is allowed to use that code, but RC4, the name RC4 was trademarked. So he couldn't use that name in uh, the names of variables, in the names of classes. He had to change all the names and they end up changing it to ARC4, which means alleged RC4 instead of RC4. So they, that, that's what you have to do. If you notice that there are trademarks or other names in your software, in the software you take, and there is no real reason for you to use that trademark, that name, you have to just change it. What is a valid reason to use it? It's for instance, if it's in the API. If it's in the API and you have to use that, you have to address other programs using that trademark, that name as part of variable, you have to use it. That's an objective reason. The same as you can refer to uh, Office as uh, it's a Microsoft uh, name. Well, you can say this is Office. You can address it as Office. So you can ju address uh, variables as their name, even though they are trademarked. But here, he just took code, and there was no real, no valid reason to have the trade name in his code. So he had to change all the uh, the names. He also encountered all kinds of strange clauses. Here it's um, an example. Uh, he got uh, Sun code from, uh, from a website and it was published by Sun under a free software license that he could use. But in the, co in the code, they still said that it's uh, confidential uh, information. And so he went to the IBM lawyers and said, well, uh, I've got this license, but on the other hand, they say it's confidential. What should I do? And in the end, the IBM lawyer said, well, maybe we have a license to use it under copyright, but we don't really know what it is, that confidenti confidentiality clause of Sun, so we'd rather not take the risk. So he had to leave out the functionality because he was not sure about what it meant to keep the software confidential, even though it's published on the internet. So they didn't want to take the risk, and they took it out. Another one, last example, um, is uh, an example of some developers that said, well, you can use my software, but not in a nuclear environment. Well, Bruno wasn't really intending to use iText in a nuclear environment, but IBM just didn't want. Yes? Well, so, it, so it's a bit, uh, doesn't really matter if uh, the library written in Java has or does not have that clause, or you can use it in Java uh, has it anyway, so yeah. But you can use a different interpreter though, which doesn't have such a clause. 
Well, that's the problem with all these license compatibilities. Uh, the open source definition clearly says that you can't do that. That if you contribute code under an open source license, then it must be uh, it cannot dis discriminate against uh, certain groups. Even though it's 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 uh, they give us example the South African apartheid regime. You can really hate these people, not like them. You don't want them to use the code, but if you want to publish it under a free, uh, open source software license, then you must accept it that even that kind of people uh, use uh, your code. You can be against abortion and against weapons, but if you publish your software and, and against uh, nuclear installations, if you publish your software under an open source software license, you must accept that also that kind of people or, or for that, that your software is used for that kind of projects. And you see for iText, that kind of clauses is really a problem. He, Bruno didn't have any, uh, he really didn't want to use the software for nuclear purposes, but he couldn't use that uh, software as such. So he had to go contact to the, to the developers. He really had to explain them what he intended to do with the software. And then they said, OK, you can use our software. We will drop that close and you get a regular open source license. It's a problem we often uh, encounter as a lawyer. And then, then our clients come with the strangest things like, OK, we found this software. We, we would like to use it. But it says, uh, if you use my software, uh, buy me a free beer or buy me pizza. and then." You were there, okay, uh, <laughs> what are we going to do with it? Um, well, you can't use that software. It's a pity because the author, he probably doesn't count on having a beer or a pizza, but he writes it. So if somebody really wants uh, to have a clean copy uh, code from, from the IP point of view, then re you really uh, should avoid that kind of thing. So as, as, an, um, as an author, uh, avoid that kind of strange clauses. There are so many uh, free and open source software licenses. Pick one of them, pick one of the standard ones. You have seen the flowchart. It's already really difficult uh, to match all these licenses. Don't start with your own IDs like, like uh, give me a free beer, don't use it in, 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 in nuclear installations. Use one of the standard ones if you want your software to be used uh, in the community. In the end, when uh, Bruno did that exercise, he did it for more than a year, uh, ITEX was shipped as part of the Eclipse uh, project in, in 2007. And now, as of 2007, he was sure about the IP rights in, uh, in ITEX. And now, if you want to contribute to ITEX, you have to sign uh, your contributor's agreement. He's really strict in it. So uh, he professionalized his uh, free uh, software project. You can see it also if you check his website. All the contributors, they are named. You have got the licenses that are on there. Everything is there. So it's important if you want to have a project that is uh, up to standard, that is professional, you need to take care of your IP. What is the current situation? Um, apparently, I, I, I didn't uh, talk to Bruno about uh, the, 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 the situation, but what I found on the internet is that apparently they, all the contributors own the code uh, together. Uh, the ITEX BVBI um, uh, is responsible for guide, of guarding the code, so they enforce it and they, they give licenses. Uh, you can have a uh, FOSS license, it's a Mozilla public license agreement, it's a weak copyleft agreement. But you can also buy a commercial license from the ITEX software corporation, it's a Texas corporation. Why would you want to have a commercial license if you can have a free one? Well, of course, a free one, the Mozilla public license, it's not because you don't have to pay that there are no obligations. There are several obligations in a Mozilla public license. For instance, you have uh, no indemnification. There is no warranty on the software. If you pay for your license, you will get warranty and somebody will say, okay, you can use this, this, this software, I guarantee. Another one is uh, you have to distribute source code with, um, uh, with, with your product. Uh, maybe it's not 
too difficult for an average free software project, but for instance, uh, a, a company like Philips, if they have to uh, distribute the source code with every TV they sell, with every, every uh, cell phone they sell, with everything they sell, with free software included, under a regular free software license, they have to um, make available the source code. It's so difficult, so they are, willing, they are often willing to pay the author for a regular license, just not to have uh, to distribute the source code. Another one is uh, you have uh, to include the Mozilla license itself with your software, with your product all the time, which is also a hassle. Uh, it's copyleft, so if you use, if you include the iClick software in uh, your own software and you make a derivative work, you will have to publish your own software as open source software, so you can sell it. So if you don't want to have these hassles, you can call them and get a commercial license and pay for it. Also, you can't change the uh, PDF producer line in generated PDF files. If you pay them, you can. Um, and of course, support, they will support you if you pay them. So, my thanks to Bruno Lavaggi for allowing me uh, to use iText as an uh, example. Uh, the message of uh, this small talk is uh, if you don't pay attention to the IP situation of your project, uh, you may end up lose a lot of money if, or, or opportunities. Uh, for instance, uh, for, for Bruno, it was inclusion in, in the Eclipse project. Uh, it will diminish the usability of your software uh, to a lot of people, so take care. Thank you. Yes? Yes, they have the Eclipse Foundation has their own license, uh, and it's not compatible. Compatible. But now it's Mozilla license and it's included in Eclipse. Is there a separate license for Eclipse? Uh, yes. Okay. So basically, it's like a commercial license that they attributed to the Eclipse project. Yes. Well, they will just get uh, updates under their license agreement, but it, it will not be uh, the regular one. They can just download it under the uh, Mozilla license, but they will provide it under their other uh, agreement that I know, don't know the details of. Yes? I'm not, uh, not a developer, I'm not an expert on the licenses, but I was wondering uh, if they... Um, <laughs> Well, they own all the copyrights, so they are, they, they are the owner, they have the option. They, you can't infringe your own copyright, so they can say, it's a permission, you can say, okay, to you I'm going to give a Mozilla license, and to you I'm going to give a GPL3 license, and you, you're going to pay for it, if you want it. So you can, it's, you can choose because you have all the copyrights, but I gave you a Mozilla license, so you can only do with the software whatever is permitted under the Mozilla license. You cannot take the decision to license it under GPL3 or to sell the software. You can only uh, distribute it under another uh, Mozilla license, because that's what the Mozilla license says. This? At this moment, uh, it's Bruno Lovagy and all the contributors. I don't know the details of the contributor agreement, but it says on their website it's shared ownership, but I, I should uh, ask uh, Bruno himself. Um, apparently it was valuable enough. You should ask Bruno and, and IBM why IBM uh, chooses for iText, uh, but iText issue, I, I know Google uses it, uh, I think Fortis Bank uses it. Uh, it's, it's apparently a really, 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 really good library and a lot of companies use it, so why not uh, Eclipse? Well, the reason that they, in the beginning, didn't want to use it was the IP situation, but now that it's resolved, why not?
it, it took an entire year. I didn't ask how many uh, man hours, but uh, it was a research project. He works for the University of Ghent. Uh, so they relieved him from his other tasks and he had an entire year to spend just checking all the lines of codes, the probably hundreds of thousands of lines of codes, one by one. And every time he noticed something strange, he had to give a call to the, the, the uh, IBM lawyers and they would discuss it. So it's an enormous task. You'd better do it from the beginning, right? Yeah. Yes? So as of 2007, uh, ITEX has no more license problems? Uh, <laughs> that's what Bruno says. He, he really takes uh, good care, but of course you can't avoid uh, all problems because they continue taking code from other projects and it's often uh, without warranty given to you and you don't know whether also the other uh, projects are up to standard, but uh, he's really doing a great effort. But I ask because I remember uh, there being a Debian bug about PDFTK which uses, which used uh, iText, and Debian replaced iText uh, with something else because iText had some uh, problem with the license, and that's also why we removed it from uh, uh, the GNUsense uh, distribution. So mm. I, I don't know the details of that, and I can't say that all the problems are solved. Um, but I, I know that uh, if Bruno. Uh, tells you that it's solved, it's probably true because he, he really does a good effort in it. I saw somebody, no? No more questions? Okay, thank you.